Hi, everyone, and welcome to Pay Dirt, a Penn State football show. Along with former Penn State and NFL quarterback Matt McGloin, I'm Tom Hannafin. This show is brought to you by our sponsors, Funk Brewing, the official craft beer partner of Pay Dirt. Now, we're big fans of Funk Citrus IPA and Silent Disco IPA. However, we want to let you know about some Funk Brewing beers that are available this month. The Silent Luau Hazy IPA is out right now in Funk's tap rooms in Emmaus, Elizabethtown, and York. And it's on the way to your favorite grocers and beer distributors. Also, the crew and Belgian style white ale is available now. You can find a variety of funk brewing beers at your favorite beer distributor and grocery store. Visit funkbrewing.com to learn where and how you can get their fantastic products. Must be 21 years or older to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Also, Pater is brought to you by our partners at Bet Online, who continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's Wimbledon Finals, Major League Baseball, the latest fighting news, and even next season's early NFL futures. Head to betonline.ag or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit and use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, to get the bonus and get into the action. Action. Pay Dirt is presented by Bet Online, where the game starts. And as we mentioned many times before, uh, now Pay Dirt has its own merchandise. You can head to shop.believe.com, that's shop.bleav.com, and search Pay Dirt for not one, but two official Pay Dirt pieces of merchandise. One is the official show logo over the heart, and it's got uh, it's available in white, black, and navy blue. And then, of course, we have the one that is uh, adorned with Matt McGloy's name and number on the back. I'm wearing a version <laughs> of it right now uh, on our YouTube channel. So uh, you can get that at shop.believe.com. Thank you for tuning in on ESPN State College, as well as checking out the podcast version of the show presented by the Believe Network, which is available now on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, hit us up on Twitter and let us know what you think of the show at ESPN Radio 1037, at McGloin QB11, and at Tom Hannafin. Matt, I'm stoked for this episode because we've been very fortunate in that uh, yeah. we only have had one other quarterback on here before, outside of yourself, that is, in uh, the great Trace McSorley. And today's guest is a guy who set and for a while owned a lot of Penn State offensive records for Penn State quarterback Zach Mills. Um, how much respect do you have for yeah. what Zach accomplished in Happy Valley? I mean, to play for four years, <laughs> you know, at the quarterback position at, at at a Division I school that doesn't happen very often, and especially at a school like Penn State. Because, Tom, as you know, all throughout Joe Paterno's career, like younger players right. never played. You know, it, it, it was kind of yeah. you sit and wait, you sit and wait, and you learn how to play. That way, when you walk on that field Saturday afternoon at Beaver Stadium, you're more than ready to play. You're more than ready to contribute and help your team win games. Um, but to be able to do what Zach did for four years is so impressive. And Tom, in the early 2000s as well, you got to remember the program you know, was battling through some difficult years, some ups and downs. Um, but, but again, Zach was there week in and week out. Um, you know, was one of the more consistent players we've seen all throughout Penn State. Um, had the ability to run, throw the ball, create. Um, you know, he he was a fun quarterback to watch. Experienced pretty much all of the ups and downs that playing in the Big Ten had ha had to offer. Right, continue to battle, um, and he's still a top or near the top of pretty much every Penn State quarterback. You know, record that there is. So you know, one of the best to ever do it at Penn State. Really looking forward to our conversation. And we got Zach here in just a moment. You know, you of uh, anybody can relate to Zach in terms of what you experienced, notably during 2011 and 2012. Just the unbelievable pressure that existed both on the field and off the field. Uh, and, and Zach experienced a modicum of that. You know, there was the um, the, the extraordinarily difficult time regarding Adam Talaferro. Uh, you talked about it. There was success in 2002, but then Joe Paterno's head was being called for in 03 and 04, and that's when you saw the team kind of rebound and get to an Orange Bowl in 2006. The identity of the program was being questioned, and when you're the quarterback and you're under the most scrutiny, I, I, how much stress is that day to day? Um, you know, yeah, it's certainly difficult, Tom, but yeah, I think you're, you know, one of the things you remember is that, you know, you go back to consistency, right. And being that same person day in and day out, being that leader that your team looks for, um, you know, uh, having the support of teammates and coaches, right. And just kind of focusing on the task at hand, 
right? One day at a time, you continue to march forward, continue to do your job and focus on that. And, uh, you know, Zach was a guy that was able to do that for four years at Penn State, be that leader, be that captain. And, you know, if you look at some of the court, he kind of paved the way for, for quarterbacks like myself. But if you look at the quarterbacks that came after him, right, Michael Robinson, Daryl Clark, um, you know, Hackenberg, Trace McSorley, um, you know, now Sean Clifford. I mean, you know, there's there's been some pretty good, pretty consistent quarterbacks that were also very good leaders as well. Um, you know, so, uh, um, you know, again, it was it was incredible to watch Zach play, um, you know, um, and uh, and again, fantastic that we have him on the show. He set a standard. He certainly did. Uh, so we're going to get to Zach Mills here in just a moment, but just a little plug ahead for next week here on Pater. Uh, we've got a buddy of yours that not only did you guys have some experience at Penn State together, but uh, also in the XFL, former Penn State defensive back, uh, played in the National Football League, and I would describe him as a former athlete turned entrepreneur and executive, uh, Justin King. And I'm really excited to talk to Justin King next week because he went from a five-star recruit, three years at Penn State, gets drafted, nice experience in the NFL, and now he's doing a lot of really positive things that are influencing the game on and off the field. So very excited to have Justin King with us next week. And uh, I know you've got a different perspective than him because obviously walk-on versus five-star, I cannot wait to hear the juxtaposition (laughs) of what that was like. (laughs) Oh, you know how I feel about, you know, uh, the stars and the recruiting yeah. rankings and everything like that. But no, you, you look at a guy like Justin King, a, a tremendous athlete, just somebody who can step on the field and just do it right. Can play with anybody. But now you look at what he's doing. He's one of those guys that was able to make the transition from the field, you know, into this next chapter of his life and is being extremely ex- successful again in, in in this chapter. So again, really excited to talk to him. And have yeah. Him so show. next week, we're going to speak to former Penn State uh, defensive back Justin King. But right now here on Pater on ESPN State College, we are joined by former Penn State quarterback Zach Mills, who owned most Penn State passing records and offensive records at the time of his graduation, a four year starter. It's quarterback to quarterback. Joining us now here on Paydirt, a man who owned well over half a dozen Penn State offensive records upon the time of his graduation. He is former Penn State quarterback Zach Mills. Uh, For those that don't know, Zach, uh, right after graduating from Penn State, played a little bit with the Washington football team, did a little bit in the coaching world. Uh, Zach, what are you up to nowadays? Uh, I'm I'm selling sporting goods. So I work, I'm back in the Maryland area where I grew up. I work for a company that sells sporting goods for all team sports. So we, we work with c- local colleges and, and high schools in the area and, uh, you know, sell from uniforms, equipment, apparel, the, the whole deal. And it's, it's fun. It keeps me involved with, with the sport I love of football and get to talk some X's and O's with some coaches and kind of talk sports all day. So it, it's, it's fun for me. Well, you're on the right show. That's exactly what McGloin and I do. So this is perfect. <laughs> um, I, I was, you know, I was going back and doing some homework on you and, and the statistics that you uh, put up in your time at Penn State and the records that you owned upon your graduation were staggering. You owned the passing yards record, passes completed, passes attempted, total offense, total offense in a single game, most passing yards in a single game. And you tied Tony Saka and Todd Blackledge for total passing touchdowns at 41 by the time that you graduated. And I know, uh, you know, it gave way to a lot of fantastic quarterbacks that followed you. You were playing, uh, you know, with Michael Robinson. Daryl Clark then shows up. My co-host, Matt McGloin. You get uh, Christian Hackenberg, you get Trace McSorley, and we're now enjoying Sean Clifford. Like, it's really amazing. But um, looking back on all those records that you set, how aware of them were you at the time and how much did they mean to you once you graduated? Uh, wasn't aware very much at the time. I mean, as, as I got into my senior year, I, I realized just because I, I had played for pretty much three and a half years up there that, that I was, you know, some records were, were being broken, but I, I appreciate it so much more now as you get older, you kind of appreciate those, those things and those accomplishments. But in the moment, it was just more about how do we how do we beat Iowa? How do we how do we handle Michigan and Ohio State and those those guys from week to week and in in the big picture of things? Um, but a lot of it goes, you know, I didn't have the biggest arm in the world, um, accuracy and and kind of beating defenses with mentally were kind of my advantages. So 
for me, the, the big point was just being lucky enough to play like with the first round pick, Brian Johnson at receiver, play with Larry Johnson in the backfield, play with Tony Hahn, who played, you know, for the Eagles for a couple of years um, and getting those guys the ball, putting it in spots where they can make plays and, let, and letting them do their thing. So that, that was the big thing um, for, for me. Matt, wasn't it uh, you were close to breaking the single game passing record, but Bill O'Brien pulled you and he didn't care that you were about to get the record? <laughs> Yeah, it was Indiana my senior year, I believe. And I was closing in on, at the time, I think it was 399, right, Zach? Yes. Yeah. And I knew what I knew, like, I knew what the single game passing record was, but at Beaver Stadium, and I think we've talked about this before on the show, Tom, back at, back then, like, Beaver Stadium didn't show your stats. Yes. Like, you play, you play at Purdue, Iowa, wherever else, they'll say, hey, Zach Mills is. You know, 21 for 28 for 257 yards and touchdown. Those show stats. Penn State never did that. So you never knew where you stood or where you were at. I didn't know where I was at. Hat and it got late in the game. I guess somebody told Bill that uh, I was nearing the record. And Bill was like, I don't care about any records or anything like that. So that's why I didn't break the record. But had I known I was that close, Zach, I would have broke the record that day because I would have changed the play. Oh, you had to have. You had to have. You knew. <laughs> But uh, I, I, I think the game was pretty in hand at that point. So I, I wasn't upset when Bill pulled you uh, to, to see that hold on. And plus, you got a couple more as you went on through your career. Yeah. So so uh, kudos to you on that. It's something we talked to Evan Royster about is that it's like, you, know, you guys pay attention to records. Like Royster said, like he was aware Saquon Barkley was very close to uh, breaking his rushing record. Ultimately, Royster has retained it by, I think, a little less than 100 yards. But like. Players care about that stuff. Like it's something that's I don't know if you're popping champagne like the 72 Dolphins <laughs> or anything, but you're like, eh, it'd be nice to hold on to that for a while. I think I think as we get older, we care more about it because it's kind of mm-hmm. all we have to hang on is the is the <laughs> memories and the locker room, the teammates, and then and then those records. And so, you know, while we're rooting for for the current guys to, to have success, we still want to hold on to those if we can. Zach, you talked about some of the teammates that you played with, you know, uh, the the Johnsons, Hunt. I mean you really played with a who's who. And I understand some of the years that you're playing there, the, the win loss record didn't reflect the talent on the field, but like it, it's Larry Johnson, Brian Johnson, Tony Hunt, Paul Puzlesny, Dan Connor, Cameron Wake, uh, Alan Zemitis, Spice Adams, Jimmy Kennedy, Tom Bahali, Jay Alford, Scott Paxson, Tim Shaw. Like it's just ridiculous. The guys that you had on both sides of the ball, how aware of you were that even though, Hey, the win losses weren't perfect. Yeah, I mean, um, so I kind of look at it in two waves. You, you, you kind of named some guys that I played with in 2001, 2002 that were very, very successful in first, second, third round draft picks. Um, you know, the Brian Johnsons, the Larry Johnson, the Spice Adams, uh, Jimmy Kennedy, those guys. Um, and then Derek Wake was my co-captain and came in the same year and left the same year I did. Um, very aware. And then 2002 was kind of the year that, you go back and think about once a week and, you know, we're a couple plays away in, in three big games and it, it could be a much different season than it was at nine and three and then nine and four in the bowl loss. But, um, and then that new wave, the, the wave that came in kind of Oh, four Oh three, where they were kind of young and developing um, with the Paul Pelosi and the, and the Dan Connors and those guys. I mean, you could tell they were super talented. Pozlesny was, was someone that stood out immediately. I mean, I remember, um, as a true freshman in practice, you know, we were doing either 11 on 11 or maybe even seven on seven where they ran a blitz or, and I was just trying to get out of the pocket and mo- I had enough of athletic ability where I could kind of get the angle on those guys. Paul, no, no, I couldn't. I, I just, I had to stop, pull up and just throw it away. And I just started laughing. Cause I'm like, damn, this guy can run, man. It's uh, he's just a different animal at that position. So yeah, it was, it was awesome to have that look back at that experience and, and play with that many people that had that much success at, at Penn State and at the next level. You know, you know Zach, being a four-year starter doesn't happen often, or, or at least it didn't happen often back then, especially at a school like Penn State. Because as we know, Joe always wanted yeah. you know, his younger players to sit and learn and wait their turn and make sure that they were ready for that moment and, and ready to walk into Beaver Stadium and be a starter and to contribute. But for you to be named the guy so early on in your career, what was that like for you? It was sort of surreal. It didn't really kick in probably till my my sophomore year when I was kind of the guy for a full off season. Um, I think looking back at the whole experience for me, um, 
when I was looking at places to play, I committed to Penn State at the time. It was very early in the process. You know, back then they didn't really start recruiting you until your um, junior year or so or, or during your junior year. And I, I got um, committed in Penn State to Penn State in April, my junior in high school. And obviously you go up there, you fall in love with the school and, and yeah. the facilities and all that stuff. But I also looked at like the, the roster and assuming I was going to redshirt, I, I had a good shot after that to be the backup um, this following year. And in my head, uh, being the backup was the goal because you're one play away. Then the, the guy ahead of me at the time, Matt Seneca had a year or two left. And then I would kind of maybe fall in line to what you talked about, Matt, or being a, a, a junior or something like that starting to play. But, um, things kind of fell into place in 2001 when Matt, um, was banged up a little bit. So I got in game one and played pretty well. And then that kind of got the ball rolling with that. So um, it was just one of those circumstances where the depth wasn't what it kind of had been in the past at that position. Um, I was competing against a couple freshmen that came in with me and was fortunate enough to kind of win that position, that, that job become the backup. And then it kind of went from there. You know, being the guy, in know, one, and, and you look at, the Penn state program throughout the nineties, a program that won 97 games, you know, mentally for you, what was that like? Like, Were were you, did you think at all about that? Were you aware that you were the guy to kick off, you know, the two thousands or was there any added pressure because of who Penn state was throughout the nineties? Well, I was, I was aware. I didn't know they had 97 wins. You say that it starts to start to get the the pressure and the anxiety right now. But um, I grew up hating Penn state. I'm I'm from Maryland. My grandfather had season tickets to the university of Maryland football. My dad had season tickets. Um, And if you know the history of those two teams playing um, I think Maryland's won twice or three times, maybe in like 45 tries. Mm -hmm. So Penn state would often dominate and destroy them. Um, So um, I was aware of the success they had, but not to that degree. So again, as a kind of a wide eyed redshirt freshman, just jumping in there. Um, it, I kind of just, just ran with it. I wasn't aware of everything that was surrounding me at that time. And I think that was beneficial to me mm-hmm. as I got older and started realizing it and, p- and picking it up. Um, you know, you realize the, the significance of what you're doing in that moment. Um, it, it's sort of, weighs on you, but you're older and have more experience. You can kind of handle a little bit better. So I, I think I was pretty lucky with kind of, you know, you're going to be the backup, Matt's the guy. And then all of a sudden, I mean, literally when I got in there for game one against Miami, Matt, Matt came running off. He had a stinger in his elbow and he couldn't feel his arm. And so he came running off screaming, I can't feel my arm. And that, they're like, go in, go in, go in. And so they just, and it was like a matter of like that I'm in there and then I'm in there and it's just kind of reacting and playing and it kind of, kind of goes from there. Yeah, I had uh, two like two of those stingers against Virginia in 2012. Face mask to the elbow, couldn't yeah. feel my arm. A few plays later, again, face mask to the elbow, could, like same spot, couldn't feel my arm. But like you're always fearful of your job. So like I, I remember going in at halftime. They they checked my arm out. Nothing was like broken or anything like that. They just put a big pad on. Like put a pad on it. Let's wrap it up. I went back out. I'm like Bill. I'm good to go back in. Let's go because you never. <laughs> You don't want to lose your job. You know, you're, right. you're always fearful somebody is going to take over, right? You never want, you never want to feel like somebody else can do your job better than you. Yeah. Um, well, and, it's and crazy the, you bring that up because, you know, I was on that side of it in 01 and, and, and not really in 02, but in 03 or 04, I was on the other side of it with, with Michael Robinson behind me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he and I get along to this day, but we were super, super competitive. And same thing, you know, I missed a game, I think in 03, a game or two with a sprained MCL. Um, and he was in there and you, you want the team to succeed in your roof form at the same time. You want to get back out there as soon as you can to, to cause you're worried about losing your job. And um, it was such a kind of different dynamic with Mike because, you know, in 04, he was our best receiver probably. Um, so, you know, do you, do you play Mike at quarterback? Uh, and then, I, you know, there's no, or do we need Mike at a running back and receiver and slot and all these different positions at the same time, he's trying to get practice for quarterback. Cause we all know that no five, he had a hell of a year and took the team to the orange bowl. So um, it was always that dynamic of uh, how do we get Mike on the field? How do we play Mike? What's the best spot to get Zach and Mike together. So, um, and then you're always feeling that pressure of keeping your job, staying healthy, staying on the field. 
You said it perfectly. You, you always want the team to succeed. You want the team to win. You want to embrace your role and you want to do everything you can to contribute. And again, help the team play well and help the team win. But with that, Zach, what expectations did you have for yourself at Penn State? Um, I think for myself, it was just to, you know, sounds cl- really cliche, but just be the best I could be. I think as a quarterback, in my mind, I just wanted to play as clean a game as possible. Um, and to me, that was not turning the ball over, making the right decisions, getting the ball out of my hands and, um, you know, putting the team in the best spot to score points. Um, yeah. You know, I think, you know, I don't know how you feel, Matt, but for me, um, the games when we were scoring 35, 40 points uh, were a hell of a lot better than we were scoring seven or 10, uh, whether it was a close game or not, because you know, you know that on your side of the ball, you, things are moving. The game plan is working. Everybody's executing. And, you know, as long as you, have, you feel like if you have the ball in your hands, you're going to make a play and help the team win. Um, so for me personally, I mean, that was that was what I love most. I, I love the preparation week to week and game planning and watching film and breaking guys down. And then it, it, it's such a such a great feeling to go out there on Saturdays and have that execution come to fruition. And, you know, I remember in Wisconsin in 01, uh, no, 02, we were um, out there and um, I had a, I got a stinger in my shoulder. I I went out for like a series and before I went to the locker room, I told Mike, um, I said, everything we prepared for, Every look you're, I'm seeing out there is what we what we practice, what we saw on film. They're not changing and not doing anything different. Um, so just go go with whatever's whatever we practiced all week because um, you know it's just such such a great feeling to put all that time in all week and then see it happen on Saturdays. You know, uh, looking at your career as a whole in those four years, you played in 43 games, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, it's a lot of football. You've experienced the ups and downs. Yeah. You know, pr- pretty much all of the ups and downs the Big Ten has to offer. You know, the good years, struggles as well. Yeah. How did you handle those moments to be able to continue to lace it up week in and week out? I mean, there was, some, there was you know, uh, Tom had mentioned, you know, the good years, the bad years. There was a threat of j- people wanting Joe to retire back yep. then in the early 2000s. How were you able to handle all of that mentally and continue to take the field each and every Saturday? I think there's a, a story out there that's, been talked about the board came to Joe and wanted him to kind of step down uh, after a three, I think, and he, or maybe a four. And he told him to essentially pound sand. And um, it, it was tough. The last two years were tough. Um, I kind of look at them as two different seasons because, you know, I don't know. Um, hopefully you haven't had this experience, Matt, but um, there's a, there's a teams that, that aren't winning. And then there's, there's teams that aren't winning, but they're good teams, if that yes. makes sense. And absolutely. Um, I think 04 was that. Um, again, we were we were pretty young at a lot of positions. There was a ton of new talent that was in and coming in in 05. And I think we were just learning how to, to win. There was a lot of close games against some good teams in the Big Ten in 04, where, um, again, a player two here or there, and, um, you know, it turns a four-win season into a seven- or eight-win season. Um, but that's how close we were. And I think that that team – fought to the end, stuck together. And I think it, it, it built a lot into the, into the 05 season where they had won the big 10 and had that, that success. But personally it's tough because uh, obviously the quarterback position is the first that's looked at. And, you know, there, if the starter is not playing well or, or close enough, any sort of inclination, that he's not playing well, everyone's going to immediately want the backup. And um, mm-hmm. I experienced that a ton in 03 and 04 and it's, it was tough. It's, it was harder for me to digest, I think, um, after the fact, when I was done playing. Uh, it took a couple of years to kind of accept and, and deal with that internally. Uh, in the moment, I think you're just trying to get through week to week and sit, and how can you get back and, and win a football game. Um, and again, I played in an era, I was lucky, where there wasn't really social media. I mean, Twitter, I think it just started in 03 or 04. There wasn't, I mean, not Twitter, sorry, Facebook. There wasn't Twitter. Um, and it wasn't what it was today. So um, for me, it was it was dealing with some nasty emails and dealing with some nasty voicemails on my uh, campus apartment phone line. But <laughs> oh you know, I can't imagine what you had to deal with Matt and the guys today. It's just it's insane. Yeah. 
Can you imagine somebody calling your house and leaving a voicemail about <laughs> like, oh, you were terrible this weekend? Oh, my God. It's unheard of, right? Because no one even has a house line these days. You know, it's crazy. Our parents do. That's about it. Right. That's true. My parents still do. They oh, still my do. God. So, yeah. Zach, you know, you talked about the the quarterback position specifically. And, and granted, there have been so many rule changes to help offenses, both at the college level and the professional level. When you look at what it takes to be a quarterback at either level now, what do you think about the evolution of the position? I think it's awesome. And you know, I sound like an old guy, but I kind of am at this point that I wish I could play, play in, in it now with, um, you know, I think I was athletic enough to kind of move around a little bit. And, it, and nowadays it's more about quick decisions and getting the ball out of your hands and being accurate than it is with, um, you know, lasering something in there. Um, so I think it would be a, a hell of a lot of fun to play in and, um, you know, it's it's a lot of fun to watch. That's for sure. So, I I definitely look back and or look at it now, and you know, would have been nice to kind of jump in one of those run and gun offenses for sure. Mm-hmm. That would have been interesting. Um, you know, you talk about how technology has evolved and so much about college football has has changed. And uh, you know, Matt and I feel like a broken record. We talk about almost every week here on the podcast in terms of name, image, and likeness benefits. They're here to stay. Yeah. Um, there was a recent interview uh, done by our friends at Blue White Illustrated with uh, a gentleman by the name of Jason Belzer, who, for lack of a better description, is the general manager of the NIL collective for Penn State, known as Success with Honor. They they help provide NIL benefits for every sports program. Not every college uh, program has that. Some of them it's specifically for football and men's basketball. Uh, for Penn State, it's every program. Um, mm-hmm. In the interview. Jason Belzer was talking about how one thing that they're bringing to student athletes on every team is these activations. So, for instance, if a car dealership is going to donate X amount of dollars, then all of a sudden, hey, Zach Mills is going to come and do an appearance for said car dealership. All well and good on paper. But my question to you is, I don't think people are realizing that when you're adding in these, quote, activations and appearances, that you guys are student athletes. And you guys have stuff to do like the schedule for being an athlete alone is daunting. And then you add in your course load. Could you possibly fathom your schedule from back in the day? And then, oh, by the way, we've got to send you to Belfont to do some sort of appearance (laughs) or something. Yeah, Yeah, it's a good point you bring up. Um, You know, I don't know in season. Uh, you probably have to devote maybe some of your off day to do things like that and kind of work that around because, I mean, during the week, it's it's go from the second you get up kind of till you, you put your head on the pillow at night um, with practice and meetings and school and, and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, that's that's a that's a helpful point you bring up. I hadn't necessarily thought about that, but I think I think, you know, if something like that's going on, you can work it around, like I said, on your off day or, or definitely off season for sure. Um, and then I think um, the other thing is, is that that kids these days at that age are, are used to the quicker style of, of, of life. Like sure. life was lower back then, you know, there was less technology. So I think, I think they're sort of piped into that. Oh, I need to be here at this time. And then I go here and then I'm doing this and that. And I think that's just sort of the way things are to, to a degree. So I think that helps them helps them as well. It, it's such a weird time because there's a, an alleged story from uh, the university of Miami that they're paying some recruit, uh, a quarterback, $9.5 million to come play at Miami. So it begs the question for me, as I just asked you, if you were a player now, would you rather just get paid to come to the school or it's like, Oh no, come here. And then we'll set you up to go to some local function. As you mentioned on your one off day, when it's like, I got enough going on. It's kind of insane that this is what college football's gotten to. Yeah. I mean, it's um, when you hear that number thrown out there dollar wise, <laughs> it is, it is insane. Um I, I feel like one is that um, 40 year old me would tell 18 year old me that take, take a class to help you manage your money. If you're going to make that have that much money back then. Uh, and then two, you got to look at the whole picture. Um, you know, wherever you go, if you're playing division one football with NIL these days, you're going to make some money. Um, it's not all about that as hard as it is to kind of get your head around at that age. Um, so you got to look at the whole picture of the program and where you're going and what you want to do 30 years from now type thing and see if that's the best fit for you. 
Matt, we've talked about it before in terms of the the quarterback lineage of Penn State and, um, you know, but no bones about it. It's not necessarily a school that's putting guys in the Heisman contention every single year. But to Zach's credit, he was a finalist for the Davy O'Brien multiple times. It was an all Big Ten selection. Um, when you look at, especially in the 2000s and 2010s and what we're existing in now, has Penn State really kind of hit a groove in terms of quarterbacks? You know, the two of you included. I mean, I mean, looking at the the program now, I hope so. You know, there's there's a lot of highly touted recruits there right now, but it's but as Zach knows, it's all about development, right? You know, everybody comes in with high expectations. He's, you know, this guy's six three, six four. He's two hundred forty pounds. He's got a big arm. Well, therefore, he should be good. Well, no, that doesn't make sense. I mean, how does he process the information? How is he growing? How is he developing? Is he becoming a leader? Is he becoming a great communicator? Could he step in the huddle and get out? Is he looking to find the play clock? Does he understand the process? Right? Is he getting better day in and day out? Is he really understanding? how to play the game. Is he becoming a football player and not just an athlete? There's so much more to it than just, you know, Hey, he can throw it and, you know, therefore he should be good. And I think this is this question that I, that I wanted to ask Zach, because I think it's important because he was put into a position as a freshman to play early on. And now with the NIL and these guys getting paid big dollars to come to your programs, you're coming to play. Not we're, we're, I'm paying you a lot of money. You're playing. We're not waiting whether you're ready or not. So Zach, for you, when you look back now, playing early versus waiting was playing early for you the best thing or would, would you have benefited maybe waiting, you know, two years to step in and take over? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think, Playing as a redshirt freshman, I, I, I if I had to do it all over again, I, w- I would do it that way. Um, what I would, what I also would do all over again was redshirt and sit that year and and play on the, the practice squad and go against the first team defense four days a week, five days a week. Mm-hmm. Um, that for me was huge. I could adjust to the speed of the game. I could process things at that and, and develop. Um, it also, to be frank, it also helped me to develop a adjust to college life. There's a, there's an adjustment there to being 18 and being away for the first time and, and, and dealing with, dealing with all that. And, and so it helped me deal with all of that, get acclimated to that, and then really jump in that following spring and, and try to do what I could to, to help the team and be a starter. And um, that that's gone away at this point. I mean, there's two, touted freshmen coming in now and they're to your point, Matt, I mean, their expectation is, is to play and to push yep. Clifford um, and for playing time. Um, and then you throw in the money factor and, you know, I hadn't even thought about that too, but yeah, they're, you're getting paid. There's an expectation to, to, to go out and, and do things. And um, it, it certainly adds a whole nother dynamic to the whole process. And um, you know, where does that go year two or year three when that person's not playing? Are they not going to get paid or they take that away from them? You know, I mean, it just it just brings up all these things that are just interesting. And it's just something we haven't seen at the college level. You mentioned having that, that red shirt freshman year, which I had. And, you know, you're running the scout offense, you're running the card offense, whatever, whatever they call it these days. Yeah. But I mean, I was going against Sean Lee, Navarro Bowman, Aaron Maben. I remember one time just planted me into the ground, into the ground. He sacked me like, you're not supposed to hit the quarterback, but it was Aaron Maven. Nobody said, nobody said anything. Yeah. No one's going to say anything when you're on the scout. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that was right. But that for me, like that, that was so important to get those reps for that whole year because, you know, I'm getting the ball to my hand on time or I'm going to get hit, you know, and I'm playing, I'm playing against all big 10 guys, all American guys. Like that, that was so important to have that year. Um, you talked about earlier, uh, you know, your ability to create a little bit, the ability to run a little bit. Um, when you watch guys today that can do both, run and throw, I'm talking about, you know, I think there's something special about knowing when to tuck it and go yeah. or when to throw it, right, compared to just, hey, I know I can run. I'm just going to look to run. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, 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 you see a lot of guys do it today because they're unsure. How did you find that throughout your career, right? No one want to stand deliver the football or knowing, Hey, I got to get out and go and create. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think my athletic ability was capped at, I wasn't someone that was going to run the ball 20 times a game. It was um, kind of 
pick and choose your spots. We ran a little bit of speed option and stuff like that. Um, and I never was, I was always looking to throw the ball. Like I only ran when I needed to, um, when something broke down or I felt pressure or, you know, that clock in your head is like the ball's got to get out or you got to get out of there. Um, that to me was, was the times to run or, you know, at times at times when it's third and four, third and five, and you're, and you're trying to hit that quick throw and it's not there and you boom, you need to take off and get the space. So I, I agree a thousand percent. I mean, defenses can plan, can plan around you better if they know that you're going to thousand one, thousand two, and just take off and run. Yep. You know, if you have the threat of, Hey, I'm going to pass first, d- distribute the ball. And if I need to run, I'll run and I'm dangerous running. And that, that makes things a whole, a whole lot different for sure. Then there was that 04 Akron game where you became the first Nittany lion under Joe Pa to throw catch and run <laughs> for a touchdown. So, you know, no big deal, as you say, all that stuff. Yeah, I just show I had a little bit of uh, skills with catching the ball. I would always joke around, hey, put me out there more. I'll run whatever you want me to run. But I only did it once or twice. So I was a, more of a decoy, which <laughs> probably probably for the better. But the, in, the, in the moment, I, I thought I was uh, Brian Johnson out there. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you had you had great succession with Larry Johnson and then Tony Hunt standing behind you. So that, that was fantastic. Yeah, for sure. Um, Obviously, the 2002 season stands out. You guys get to the Capital One Bowl. Uh, ironically, Penn State renews uh, the the series with with Auburn this year, so that's going to be exciting. But you know, when you look back at your time at Penn State, you know, it felt to me bigger than football because, as you mentioned, there was the question of you know, is Joe going to continue to be you know ste- steering the program? What is the future of this team? Some really tough years, and then. Um, you also were on the team during the saga of Adam Talaferro. Um, yeah. There are a lot of things that were bigger than football um, when you were experiencing them. And now when you look back on them, how did it help shape you? I always say that if I had to go back and do it all over again, I would do it. Um, I would do it. That's it just helped shape me into who I am today, the character I have. And um the game of football is so good. It teaches you so much and with wins and losses and the camaraderie and the teamwork. I mean, there's so much that has to go right for a play to be successful. Everyone's got to do their job. And um, it's just, um, you know, with Adam, for example, Adam came in with, with me same year, we shared shared an apartment for a couple of years and um, to see someone have so much talent, I'll never forget freshman year we're in summer camp Adam's playing and Kenny Jackson was our wide receiver coach at the time he made us rewind to play five times because what Adam did with his feet and hands rerouting a receiver he's like you don't see that every day this kid's going to play at the next level and then five weeks later unfortunately he gets hurt but to see him kind of bounce back get his law degree be successful have a family I mean it's just it's inspiring to see and it, it does it you know at the end of the day um Penn State's a great place to play football. The fans up there are awesome. There's a reason it's so successful because of the fans, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a game and we're about learning and growing and being better, better men and people as well. And I think, um, you know, stories like that really put things in, in perspective. That's for sure. You were there at a time when the identity of Penn State was challenged and ultimately proven and you got to be at the helm of that so um we appreciate all your contributions to the program we thank you for coming on here and uh best of luck with everything you've got going on are you going to be paying attention to this upcoming season i don't know how tuned in you are with the current team yeah i'm I'm, i watch from afar i'm not tuned in on the day-to-day and the recruiting and this this kid recruited here and all that but as much as you guys probably are but yeah i definitely i put it on every saturday i follow it from from afar to a degree and catch up on some articles and I'm rooting for him, especially as a as, as a guy that's played a couple of years. I'm rooting for Clifford to have the success. I know the last couple of years have been down, and he's taken a lot of heat. But um, six years at Penn State for him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's one of those guys that where you're like, you know, and I was in that same boat. We're like, that guy's still around. He feel like he's been there for, for 15 years. But and he Clifford, knows he's it. He's six. really good on social media about being self deprecating. I, I love. Yeah. It. Yeah, no, he gets it. So you can tell. So um, I, I wish him the best. And and Matt, thank you as well. You you were there for some for some tumultuous times as well. And you kind of wrote the ship right for everybody and for the program. So thank you for all you did for Penn State. Um, I've always been curious from your side of things. We kind of probably played in the same system for you. Were, you Galen Hall was your coordinator, right? 
So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, Galen and Jay yeah. you know, were, were kind of the coordinators. Yeah. And then when Bill came in, how much was that? How steep was that learning curve to, you know, because we're, you know, the Penn State Galen Jay offense, yeah. it wasn't the yeah. most verbal I, uh, verbiage as yeah. far I, as that goes. Well, first off, I appreciate you saying that, man. And, and yeah, you know, well, for you, you were a guy that just, you know, kind of paved the way for, for, for quarterbacks like me, man. Um, but, you know, to transition from what the system was to Bills was, I mean, it's like learning a different language. And, yeah. you know, I, I remember my goal at first, especially early on in the spring, was just to be able to get in the huddle and say the play, right? That's how long they were. That's how different it was. You know, uh, alerts, adjustments, um, you know, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. Check this, check that. Yeah. Right. There was always something. There was always an out. He always gave you something that you can get to, um, which kind of early on, I appreciate it, you know, because I think he knew I was a guy that was studying. I was a guy that was well-prepared and a guy that was going to do, you know, w- whatever it took to be successful and to win the job. Cause I was in a competition that spring. Yeah. Um, so I remember times where I'm just standing in front of the mirror, you reading the plays, reading the, the playbook, um, you know, and things like that. So it was definitely difficult, but once you got it, that's when it got fun. You know, you were able to, you know, talk about ideas, talk about you know, the game plan, talk about plays and things like that. So, uh, you know, it was definitely fun and exciting once we got past the, the, the past the point of learning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, we got to continue to get more quarterbacks on the show, but Zach, thank you very, very much for joining us. Uh, you're welcome back anytime and best of luck to everything you got going on. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Best of luck to you as well. Appreciate it. Thank you all so much for joining us. We'll be back on ESPN State College next Thursday, again, from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. If you want to check out the podcast version of this show presented by the Believe Network, this episode and our entire library of shows is available now on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, let us know what you think of the show on Twitter at ESPN Radio 1037 at McGloin QB11 and at Tom Hannafin. Pater is presented by Bet Online and by Funk Brewing. Thanks again, everyone, and join us next week for more Pater.